Indeed, that's, it, it echoes something Bonnie said earlier about the South African diaspora and connecting people up. L let me turn, if I could, to the final panel this morning, George Winkler, who is Rector of University of Vienna, former president of the European University Association. And George, again, the, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Um, much has already been said, so um, I would like to, to use now the category of supply and demand in order to put some fresh thoughts into what we are discussing. Now, it is very clear the supply of inno innovative activities comes mostly from the university system, uh, from the staff, from the graduates. And the demand for innovative activities comes partially from privates, from the private side, firms, companies, and so on, but also from the public side. And I would just like now to, to discuss a little bit the interaction of the two. Now, when we talk about universities, I mean, that has already been touched uh, by quite many panelists. Um, let me just say that universities are used to practice what is termed as open science. So university people are used to practice in creating and disseminating new knowledge um, for, with, and with giving up the rights over it. Uh, they do it out of a curiosity-driven approach uh, because they would like to generate further knowledge somewhere else. And that's the reason why they, 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 they publish uh, and give up the rights of it. It's also important because uh, you can't think of a university educating uh, students, uh, PhD candidates, uh, when the professor would say, well, I tell you the latest result, but before that you have to pay me something a certain fee, otherwise I won't tell you. So it is very clear that here, when it comes to the education, uh, we also practice uh, open science. And it is also important that the results are used in the innovation system. And, and that's one of the reasons. So open science has huge external effects. That's the reason why we see so much public money in that field. And, and, uh, and there is a certain tradition in practicing open science. Of course, the universities need an overhaul, and that was already said by, by John. Uh, this is the modernization of the governance structures. Uh, missions and profiles need to be reset. We also know that there is somehow a bad equilibrium because perhaps the universities do not deliver, and that's the reason why they don't get more money. But because they don't get more money, they do not deliver. So, so th they are somehow trapped in, in, in bad equilibria too, and the question is how to get out of that. It is also very important that they go more for excellence, and that's the reason why, for example, the ERC is so important. And also, let me say, parts of the framework program because they somehow set European standards of excellence and it is somehow one of the, let me say, of the pities of the European research system that quite many people within the universities are full of illusions about excellence. They think they are excellent, but they're actually not and that has to do with the national fragmentation of the university system. They are very good in a local context, but are they really good in a global context? And that's the reason why ESC is so important, and that's the reason why I would really appreciate very much if ESC would get, um, I don't know, double the sum it now receives. And we should also allude to the American case of the National Science Foundation that was already mentioned by that. And then there's another feature we have to look at, and this is universities are not so ready to take risk. And the question is how we can improve the risk taking within the universities. Perhaps that would be another feature of a European framework program that, for example, universities take more risk. That could be via EIT. 
But if it's done by a thematic collaboration, I'm not so sure whether the European framework programs really reach that objective or not. I'm, I'm skeptical on that one. And then, of course, the question is how to set incentives in the university system to better collaborate uh, with uh, those who uh, demand uh, innovative activities. And you have already been discussed and you have already pointed to some, some issues. So this is the university side and much has to be done. But if you look at the demand for innovation, it is very clear we have a private demand, companies and so on. Uh, and if you go, for example, to MIT, you will see how, how many European companies are there setting up research facilities because they have a demand for innovation and that can be satisfied, for example, by these, um, by, by, by the, the university there, by MIT and so on. And the question is, of course, how we can attract, how the European university system could attract more private innovative demand. And parts of that, what you have been saying, points into that direction. But let me conclude by one major issue, and this is public innovation demand. Now, public innovation demand usually is highly nationally fragmented. The AHO report already pointed out how important it would be to have a European innovation demand. And of course, you could argue, as the Commissioner did, that the framework program somehow creates uh, a European innovation demand. But is it strong enough? Um, if you really look at how the money is spent, most of the innovation, innovation, public innovation demand is still a national innovation demand. And I just ask you, if for example the United States now put so much money to the Department of Energy to come up with innovation activities in the field of energy, why shouldn't for example European institutions get some money there? Why shouldn't, for example, European institutions try to get money from the National Science Foundation, from the National Institutes of Health? And of course, it should be the other way around. So what we need is, is more competition with respect to public innovation demand. We need more cross-border activities with public innovation demand, and we have to face a situation how to overcome the fragmented public innovation demand. And that is actually something what should be one of the main issues at the European level. Thank you. Thank you. On, on, just on, on that question, as you mentioned it, and, and to try to link it back, Jan Mulfight in his remark talked about huge sectors, say like healthcare where in a significant way they're not yet technologically empowered, even, even with existing technologies, without even talking about you know, hugely innovative uh, future technologies. Is that the kind of thing you have in mind when you're talking about looking at uh, pan-European demand for, for, uh, well, the for innovation? Yeah, the Commissioner mentioned CREST and mentioned also joint programming. Um, I'm, I'm, I mean, it's important to have it. It's better than nothing. But I actually would like to have a quite more open system for that. Uh, I mean, this is a first step. And actually, you could argue the joint programming should have come about without the help of the European Union. So all these initiatives, like Innovative Medicine Initiative and so on, that should have come, let me say, without actually being pushed so much. So what I just would like to say is, is here we have really um, a, a demand for creating a European-wide demand. Commissioner, do you have any response to that uh, thought? Oh, yeah. Many. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, uh, I think it's fair to say that when we talk about cooperation in Europe, sometimes uh, we tend to be uh, we tend to be quite, uh, we would like to go very far, which I very much appreciate. But uh, in fact, what we try to do via the European research area is first to remove all or majority of the existing